Um, okay, so welcome. Do, do you all have your, your materials ready? We're going to talk about this, and this is going to be an amazing workshop. I am so excited. Um, I don't think there's anybody in the waiting room, so um, I'm going to get started with my intro. And um, okay, Olivia, we're, we're in good shape here. Awesome. Okay, so hello, 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 and welcome. Um, I'm Sarah, Sarah Linda Licklow, Director of Education at the Hudson River Museum, and it is my pleasure to introduce today's program, a virtual monoprint workshop with Julia Santos Solomon. We are going to be in her studio behind the scenes, experimenting with unorthodox materials to create two landscapes rendered in black over colorful abstract backgrounds. Julia Santos Solomon is the teaching artist in residence uh, in connection with our exhibition landscape art and virtual travel. Uh, and we are just so happy to be here with her today. You're gonna get to play with different effects using food coloring or ink on a dryer sheet and then print a monotype or ghost image on another sheet and draw on top of both backgrounds. And I'm sure you'll be amazed and delighted at the images that emerge with coloring that you'll see um, both vivid and subdued. So um, I'm sure by now you've found most of the required materials in your kitchen or laundry room, dryer sheets, food coloring, uh, or ink, a tray to hold the sheets, uh, tongs or tweezers, untextured watercolor or printing paper, charcoal, charcoal pencil or black paint, a brayer, um, a big metal spoon or flat bottom glass, um, heavy gauged paper for a backing and good old Elmer's glue. So um, we're gonna have some fun exploring the connections to the themes that are explored in landscape art and virtual travel. And um, we have Art Bridges to thank for their support of today's program. Um, as you may have already discovered, your microphones have been muted upon entry, though you can control your video camera. And you can also use the live transcript closed captioning option at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions or comments, please, please type them in the chat throughout the course of the conversation. And my colleague, Olivia Cipriano will be moderating the chat uh, and you will have your questions answered by the artist. So um, it's now my honor to tell you a little bit about today's guest artist, Julia Santo Solomon, who is a contemporary Dominican artist who's been creating painting, sculpture, and digital media for over 40 years. Her vision has shaped generations of successful Latinx artists as a founding member of Altos de Chabon School of Design. And she also taught fashion illustration and design at the Parsons School of Design in New York. Santo Solomon's work has been exhibited and collected nationally and abroad represented in permanent collections at the Latin Art Museum, the Indiana University Museum, Museo de Arte Moderno, Altos de Chabon Foundation, and in Yonkers at the Hudson River Museum. She is archived at the Smithsonian Archives of American Art and the Dominican Studies Institute at uh, the City University of New York. Her work has also been featured in multiple exhibitions at the Hudson River Museum, including the recent Women to the Fore and the ongoing exhibition, Landscape Art and Virtual Travel. So it is now my honor and privilege to introduce um, an artist whom I, 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 am, I hold in the highest esteem and um, a wonderful person who has become a good friend in the course of our work together. So thank you for being here for Julia Santos Solomon. Julia, I'm turning it over to you and thank you so much for being here today. What a beautiful introduction. Oh, it is my pleasure. <laughs> yeah. You know, first of all, I love this museum. I love their engagement with the community and I love the ability to be able to reach out to all of you and to share some of the things that I do in the studio, things that are easy. Today's workshop is about what do you have in your kitchen cabinet <laughs> and how can you make some interesting things with it. So on my tray, 
I have four colors. I have green, blue, red, and a little yellow. And what I'm going to do first is add some water to them. To see what, ooh, can you see my, ooh, look at my blue. Mm -mm -mm. Here's my green. The yellow is a little bit on the light side, but we'll see what it does. And here's my red. So I'm going to take one of my tongs and just stir it a little bit so that the water and the color have a chance to mix. I have a old towel from my bathroom. It's got a stain on it. <laughs> and I thought it qualified perfectly for what we're trying to do. So I think all of these things are accessible to you easily using tongs. And now I have mixed some color. Now my yellow is not very promising, so I may have to do something about that. First thing I'm gonna do, I, I fell in love with dryers from the bathroom because they have a beautiful translucency. There are areas that are open and you can see through and areas that are full and it just creates natural interest. So I'm going to put it in the water and see what it, ooh, I like that blue. And I'm gonna try a little green, not too much. Then let's see what happens with the red, a little red. And then what does the yellow really do? The yellow is turning yellow green. So I'm going to hold this so it drips a little. I have a middle section here. I'm going to put it in there. And then this is going to go on my towel here. So it has a little bit of a chance to dry. Now we don't have all day, so I'm going to fold my towel over and gently remove some water. Okay, we'll look at this one later. Okay, so these are so cheap. The fabric softener sheets that I'm going to now, I'm gonna start with the red. Ooh, it's splattering. Then I'm gonna do a little kind of yellow green that I got from before. Let me let it here, stripping a little. Let's see what happens if I put it in the green. I'm just playing with it. Ooh, you're liking what this is doing. So I'm going to put it down, fold my towel over, and gently squeeze some of the water out. Okay. Oh, now let's see. So I have one that has primarily the red, which became a pink. And I have one that is primarily blue with a little pink at the bottom and a little yellow on the top. And I'm just going to keep going. Let's see. So, you know, if you set yourself up and you want to spend Ah, I know an hour doing this at home. You know, if you have some time to just relax and do something for yourself, you know, you don't have to get all complicated with easels and paints and palettes and stuff. Sometimes, sometimes I personally just need something quick to feel like, okay, I'm experimenting with something here. Let's see, so let's do the green. Green. Well, that looks like Ellery upside down. 
And let me gently remove some water. Don't be shy. If you have questions, just go ahead and ask. I want to be able to communicate. So as I was saying before, this is a very quick way to be creative. And you don't have to make it all complicated. You don't have to go to the art store. I like that. Sometimes I just come in in the mood to do something. I'm like, okay, I'm in the mood to do something. I'm gonna try completely submerging this one in the blue. You know, I will pick anything up in my disposal when I need to do something. Uh, the drawing I'm going to be using here I found in the back of a notebook, <laughs> you know, those notebooks with the holes and the spirals that you buy at CVS. I was shocked. I'm like, what? But then I shouldn't be shocked because it's my way. If I want to draw, if I want to do something, I just grab whatever's in front of me. Now, don't miss, you know, I do have, when I do go leaf, it's very complicated, it's very time consuming. And it's very, very, um, you have to be very patient with gold leaf because it's process oriented. So I have to do one thing, then I have to wait, do something else, then I have to wait. Sometimes I just need to do something quickly. I've been drawing a lot during COVID and when I'm in Zoom meetings. I'm in Zoom meetings all day. And I bring a tiny little sketch pad that I put on the side. And I will draw on my notes. <laughs> okay, so here we go. So this was an experiment with all the colors. And at the end of, you know, time here. Oh, ooh, I like that one. Yeah, it has a lot of potential. I think I'm going to dip it again. See if it gets a little darker. You know what I haven't tried, but I would love to is red dye. I would love to try red dye. Hmm. So that gave me a more saturated color. So I'll get this. I'm going to lay it down and see what we got later. Hmm. Now the little textures in this paper automatically gives you a little mystery. I like mystery, like what's going to happen? I have no control. <laughs> no control is good. Especially, you know, when you, I'll speak for myself. I've been doing, making art for so many years. There are certain things where I feel uh, that I have great control over. And I have to kind of forget that I do sometimes. It's very good for me to say, um, I'm not quite sure how that's gonna work. Let chance take, if, take a hand at this. Hmm. So I'm gonna go with a light color saturation, let's see. Now this color has been very, very mild. You know what I'm going to do? I think I'll fold it into the tray. Fold it in the tray. It's very important for me to experiment. Sometimes when I do little playful things like this, it will lead to 
a bigger investigation later of possibilities, things that I can try. But unless I'm willing to play and not be afraid of how it's going to look, I won't find anything new. There's a piece that is part of the Hudson River Museum of mine called the Floor Scrapers. And the Floor Scrapers came out of seven years of experimenting with a new way of creating an image. And it was terrifying because I am someone who was trained to use the form. And the floor scrapers, that series was not about drawing the form. It was about putting a mark where my eye fell. So that was a complete game changer. You know, I was as uncomfortable as I could possibly be. I just knew that I wasn't really in my comfort zone, but I realized, well, if you're this frustrated, obviously it means you have to continue. <laughs> so out of those seven years of what is this and why am I doing it? Uh, out came the floor scrapers. So I'm someone that needs to experiment. And the digital piece that is part of this exhibition, that was a big experiment because it's made with, I, it's a digital marriage between a sculpture that I created and a very old painting from the eighties. So the painting, it was so old that it, I didn't have any digital images of it. It was all slides and photographs. And when I fit it into the computer, uh, it wouldn't hold up. So I had to figure out how to paint over digitally onto the painting so that it became a digital image. And then I married those two things. And I said, I don't know what's going to happen. But it was a big experiment. And all of a sudden, an image I've been waiting for since 1975 came about. I found the right media. I've been wanting to make that image for all of these years. And I kept trying different things. Actually, when I was playing with the mono, um, with the mono prints, that was the very beginning of the idea of mashing up different materials to create one image for me. And eventually it led up to the digital work. So in my case, experimenting, oh, I like that experimenting um, is a part of my practice. And you know what, let me tell you this, I don't keep everything. If I don't like something, it goes in the garbage and thank you very much. I'll see you tomorrow. So it, none of these things are precious, but they allow me to be curious. Let me see, how about one more? So I did three spotted. How about I do one more saturated? So I did a saturated one with orange and one with blue. I'm gonna saturate green. You know, I was watching a YouTube video where artists were making a paste that created texture. And they were doing it with talcum powder, very inexpensive acrylic, and paper that they shredded. And they blended it all and created this paste. 
and maybe the whole the materials cost um, under ten dollars and they made a huge vat of it and they were able to use it for a very long time and i love that i love the idea of go to your dollar store or cvs and buy these very inexpensive materials and try to make something that's different okay so i've got some green here mm, mm, i need something else okay so green mm, more green so do i go orange with it or yellow or blue hmm. i'm gonna think about it while i dunk it I have a box full of tool and, you know, can tops. Um, I'll show you. Can I see stuff like this? Can you see this? This is, this holds four beers. My, my husband bought these thin beers look at that i'm like what if i get an impression out of that i have to find the right way then i said well maybe i can make some circles with this can okay and then well here's a smaller circle with this little <laughs> plastic tub and so i've been accumulating home things that will allow me to make circular impressions and see where that goes. But I'm always looking at ordinary objects that I can play with. I went to Michael's and they had this woven gift wrapping and i said oh i have to take that home then they had this open one and it was like five dollars so i was experimenting with the little one and um I did this with my gold leaf. Can you see it? So that's me experimenting with that closed weave. Then I took the open weave one and I made this. So I'm having fun with that. This was an experiment with the cans, but I'm not happy with it yet. It's the wrong kind of texture for me. So I have to keep playing with it. Nice. It's a pretty color. Okay, I'm gonna let this just be what it is. We're just green and yeah, um, blue. Gently get the excess water out, and we'll let them dry. I have um hair dryers at home in the studio to dry things. But what I'm going to do instead 
is put this in front of my purifier. I have an air purifier over there and see if it dries faster. This was dry already. Good. This was dry already. One more. The first three are dry. So that's good. You know, you can make minor prints also um, by using real paints and painting on a glass or a piece of plexi and then putting a piece of paper over it. And I usually will take a spoon and just rub the whole surface, make sure it's nice and flat, and then I pick it up. But that involves more supplies than I wanted you to use. So we're going to take one of these. Which one do I like? Uh, I want the big blue, big orange, or combination. I kind of like the negative space in this one. Can you see? That's that kind of white that I left in the middle. So I'm going to try and remove this for a second. Try to see what it would look like with an image on top. So I am going to put a little kind of glue, something very simple like that. Stick glue. Where's my stick glue? Hold on. So if I can't find what I want, I use something else. I have to be flexible. Let's see if this Elmer's glue actually works. This is no. I need a stick. Yeah, look at that. I found the stick glue. Yeah, but it's dry. I don't like it. All right. Throw that out. And I may make a mess here, but I'm going to get a little Elmer's glue. And then I'm going to take a piece of cardboard and spread the glue. Sorry. Yeah. I have to get you back. Olivia, you have to help me with what you can see. Yes. So are you good? I think that once, yeah. So we are looking at um, your glue. Yep, yeah, that's in sight. Perfect. Now, Julia, what are you're pasting uh, a drawing that you did? Yes, I made a Xerox of it. Perfect. You know, this is the drawing that was in the back of that notebook. <laughs> I just made a black and white Xerox. Now, I remember when we were doing um, a workshop back in, I think, February, you were talking about how sometimes with these, you like to do edges that are like not straight cut and that are more um, just like, I guess, organically torn sometimes. Yes. So I like Actually, to look at the shape of the drawing. And I don't like things that are straight. So I'm trying to see where would this drawing be happening? You know, I never do this, but I may do it this time. So I'm holding it with tongs because it's very sticky. No, no, maybe. Ha. Huh. Mm. Mm. 
Um, you know, today I'm gonna just go straight. Place set, and I'm taking my tweezers and gently placing it down. Now I'm gonna use another piece of cardboard and gently. Put it in place. And then I'm going to remove the excess. For that I'll use scissors. I won't know what this really looks like or how I feel about it until it's done. So I'm just walking through it. And you know what? It, this is not precious stuff. So don't be afraid to try something. If you don't like it, just toss it. Okay. This is a picture of myself when I was four years old. And it, it was the picture inside it was my passport picture. So when you were a minor, your passport was combined with the adult you were traveling with. So I was traveling with my grandmother. So she's at my side. But there I was at four getting my first passport picture. So I'm gonna pick this, oh, you can see it here. Mm, I'll pick it up. Can you see that? Yes. Um, I that was... Because it's a passport picture, I wanted the first one to be straight on. Sort of the way it reminded me. Sometimes I like what happens on the back. You know, but this time I have this little drawing of a little girl. And let's just look at her. I'm going to see if any of the other solid colors are dry. Mine are still taking a minute to, to, to get dry. where I want them to be. <laughs> All right, yeah. so you know you can touch them and you'll know. Yeah. Make your Does fingers a little slippery. Any comments or questions? Um, so my question is, when do you know when to stop when you're doing these? There's a couple of the uh, dryer sheets that I definitely went um, a little too far <laughs> on. You got a little mm -hmm. muddle, you can't really see, but. Then toss it. Toss it, okay. Yeah, yeah, give it a it should make you feel happy. Yeah. And if you're being shy about color, just leave it in there a little longer so it absorbs it better. Mm, okay. Mm. Yeah, just let it hang out while other people ask questions. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, so if you guys have any questions, um, please put them in the chat, any comments. Um, as far as I'm concerned, so I remember that um, when we were working last time, the, uh, oh, Helen, uh, Helene wanted to know if you had a sample of the finished piece. So this is oh, one example, right? Yeah. Let's see, and we have, um, we also have a couple of monoprints that we were thinking about talking about. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want you want to take a look at those while um, everyone's kind of doing their work, Julia? Because I think my the finished piece that I put in for promotion. Yes, I can definitely piece. share that. Yeah, so that that will answer Helene's question, and you know I can elaborate if she has more that she wants to ask. Yeah, just give me one moment. I could definitely pull that up. Okay.
I just I just wanted to chime in and, and just say how privileged we are to be a part of the artistic process, Julia. And you know, Helene, in, in this case, we don't know what the finished product is going to look like. And that's what's so beautiful and organic about this particular process because it's so open-ended. So we get we get to like sort of be inside your head in a way, Julia, in terms of your process and your choices. Um, and I want to thank you for that. It's very generous. Well, so. Thank you, Cheryl. No, a nice thing to say. Oh, you know, well, I think it's um, important to share with people that not everything is precious and not everything is perfect. And if I if I don't like it, I toss it. And yeah, if I like very, it, then it leads to other investigations. Yeah, I mean, it must be very freeing. You know, and you and it yes. enables you to take risks, which is yes. what it's about, right? So, yeah. thank you, thank you. Okay, so so go right ahead now and talk about this. Okay, is that blown up, Olivia? As of right now, um, that's as far as I can go. I mean, I can, I have it over here as well, but it's okay. uh, gets a little cut off. So this, no, let's, let's go back to the yeah. full image. That's what I was thinking. So do you see the texture of the dryer sheet where you can see the white spots where it wouldn't, it's open? So I, I, I found that very exciting. And I found a beautiful leaf uh, in my yard. It was fall when I made this image. And what I did was I did a color Xerox of the leaf and I included it. And in the bottom right, it's hard to really make it out. Those are sketches that I did of two baby cheetahs. I had gone to Namibia to visit my daughter who was there working in a cheetah preserve and they had these two cubs. Now the cubs were interacting because they'd been abandoned and had to be raised um, in, in, with humans. So they tended to curl up together. So I did a drawing of them in my sketchbook. And then I printed it on a piece of film. Why? Because I had the film in the studio. And I said, well, what are you going to do with this film? <laughs> Just put it in the printer and see if it reproduces the sketch. And it did. And when the little cups reproduced on the film, the reason I thought it was interesting is because the film is see-through. If you look at the leaf, the leaf is opaque. I can't see beyond it. Then I said, well, why don't you use the film and print this eight-year-old portrait of yourself? So what I loved there was that because it's such a large image that you can see through it and you see the dryer sheet texture. And that got me all excited. So all of a sudden I discovered printable film. You know, if you go to Staples, in the area where they have all of the papers and all the photography, photo papers, they also have these transparent films that goes, feeds through your laser printer. So when this finish was finished, I thought, wow, look at that. That's so interesting. And if you are in the museum and go to the museum and you see my piece, Caribbean Thoughts Mashup, you'll see that some of the transparency that I was able to play with on this dryer sheet was something that I continued to investigate in the digital image. So this little sketch led me to something bigger and, and 
informed me. But it was all pure experimentation. And you can see the folds, you know, where the dryer sheets fold. But it doesn't matter. You and I know it's a dryer sheet. Somebody else doesn't. But I just want you to free yourself to just try things. Does that answer your question? Um, so let's see what she says in the chat. We also got another question from, uh, I think Kenneth Lloyd, but I think that's uh, not, not the right name. But um, so what kind of dryer sheets uh, do you use, she wants to know. So I use the cheapest I can find. And I know the supermarket near me is Hannaford. So I just bought Hannaford dryer sheets. <laughs> You know, whatever supermarket is near you, they're going to have them, their own brand. And I don't even know if they're $3, maybe two, I don't know. Very inexpensive. I get 120 of these. Think about that. It's a lot of art supplies for less than $5. So I like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, not and then... So the final image is the physical dryer sheet or digital printout. Um, and I think that it's a combination of those, right? Well, the final image is literally the dryer sheet. Yeah. <laughs> it literally is the dryer sheet. Um, yep. And I had it matted and framed and, you know, it looked all proper. And people were happy with it, and I was happy with it. So all of the framing elevated it to something more important. Do we have another question, or do we want to go to another model print? Um, we just had one more question and it was, how do you archive it and does it fade over the period of time? Let's see, um, archiving for me with a dryer sheet really had everything to do with the matting and the backing. So I used our arch archival matting and archival backing. So that that's what was touching the dryer sheet. And I use, I like using really good quality um, glass, but it's not necessary. I like using non-reflective glass because it really allows you to see the subtlety, but it's not necessary. What is necessary is archival backing and archival matting, because that's what's touching the image. You know, mm -hmm. the glass is on top of, and I wouldn't hang it where it gets direct, really bright sunlight day in, day out, day in, day out. Because, you know, it's food coloring. <laughs> it might fade. <sighs> so Olivia, are we moving on to Matt Phillips? Yeah, so let's take a look at this. Okay, this is very lovely monoprint. Matt Phillips um, did this beautiful landscape that I really like. And I can see that he picked up some of his color. By that I mean, do you see those really clean white shapes? He yes. went in there either with the rag or with Q-tips and clean that color completely out so that when he printed it, it would come up as a clean graphic shape. Now, it looks like he was using a paintbrush to paint the rest of the landscape. And 
the sky looks like he laid down color and then he picked up color. And you can do that with a rag, you can do that with your finger. So you have this atmosphere that he created in the sky. So the sky looks airy and the land looks solid. But I like his play with the clean graphic shapes, with the atmospheric sky, and then this painterly approach to trees and pastures and little houses. And, and you really get the sense of depth, even though it's such a simple image. Some people will put them on a a uh, monoprint through a press, you know. But if you don't have a press, you literally can do it with a spoon or with a brayer. Let me now see what's, if I have. what's the benefit of using a press? Well, a press is gonna really absorb every last drop of color. Hmm. All right, so if you're in a printing studio and you want to just do monoprints, you can do them on thin plexiglass. You can do them on thin uh, metal. And then you have a beautiful paper and you put it through and it just picks every single thing up. But if you're a little more random and a little more spontaneous, you can do it the other way. Hold on a second, see if I can find something here. Sure. This is a monoprint I did in the studio without a press. Can you see this? Yes. This monoprint has some writing that I wrote about Foyer Girl, which was the sculpture that was in the museum for women to the fore. And at the time, I wanted the writing to be on a creative paper. What I think was interesting here is that I was able to, what's called block out, meaning that I was able to put something down on the paper first where the color would not absorb. See these white shapes? I predetermined that I didn't want any color there. So I kind of drew with a little acrylic and then I applied my color and everything, the paper got you know, saturated with color, as you can see but not the areas that I blocked out. So that's an example of homemade model printing. Okay, homemade model printing. Oh, and I want you to know too, um, I have clients who just love the very simple model prints that I do, meaning, in the studio on rice paper, very, very simple, you know, scraping it with my spoon, they, they, they find them desirable and they, you know, they bought them. And um, I have to give them a little advice about how to frame them. But I'll be honest, it always surprises me that somebody wants that. Um, I, made a mono 
footprint of a landscape in New Zealand. And I printed it three times. So the first print had a lot of color in it. Then the second print was sort of medium. And then the third print was what we call a ghost. You barely could see anything. So I ended up using those three ghosts in different pieces. And um, on my web, no, you can't see them on my website. No, I took them off. They're part of uh, a group of, a series of work that I called um, the Dreaming Series. And um, it was really interesting to try to try to use the three versions in a new way and to have them speak differently. But if you actually saw the real print, you would see where it came from. I don't know if that helps, but I used all three versions of it. Ooh, Degas, Ooh, always loved him. Me too. Do you want to say a few things about this week work and how it kind of relates to some ideas that you uh, have in your own? Yeah. You know what's interesting about him? I think what I relate to him so much is because he really was a figurative painter. You know, he was all about the figure and the form and the ballerinas and those beautiful Japanese compositions. So he was highly structured in his approach, which I understand. You know, he sculpted his ballerinas. He just went all the way with four. So when I see something like this, which is loose and poetic, and he is giving you an environment, but not all the details. It's intriguing because it's a whole other side of the artist. I love this piece because it's a landscape and it ties to our theme, but I love it as a huge departure from his normal ways. You know, so when you look again at the mountains in the background, he's simply suggesting that there's growth in trees. You know, he's not giving you every single tree. You know, and, and he's creating this air between the edge of the background and the sky. You know, that white, unlike the previous modern print where the white was graphic and cleaned and lifted, this is an atmospheric white. So you feel the moisture. You, he's just suggesting so much with very, very little. And, you know, that's what draws me to this. And the colors um, are so delicate. They're not his usual colors. You know, he's just playing, I think. And this piece, for all those reasons, I thought really tied into what we're doing, which is a departure from what you would ordinarily do. And for someone like him, like myself, by that I mean people, artists who are tied to form, Really let, you know, taking your, letting your hat off and just saying, well, what is this going to give me? It's really courageous, I think, you know, particularly for him. And if you look at the upper left-hand corner where the white cloud seems to cut into the mountain, the blue mountain, I mean, that mountain gets so soft and the mountain is solid. You know, you can't get more solid, <laughs> but he's making it very, very open. 
And I love that because it, it just allows me to roam. It allows my eyes to just roam through this. And in the foreground where he has rocks and what looks like growth or moss, he's giving you structure, but it's like barely suggested. You know, it's like just the same color, brown, earth tone. He's just going, whoop, 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 we're done. You know, so I, I absolutely love this piece by Nadal. You know, I, I'm so glad that you chose this one, Julia. Um, it, for so many reasons, I mean, it is so proto-modern. It's almost a, an abstraction, which I think is, I mean, it, it was, you know, you think about more about Cezanne in that respect, but Degas was fully, I think, as, as prescient, you know, in mm -hmm. his, in his experimentation. And the fact that this is, um, heightened with pastel, I think really brings home the flexibility and the creative possibilities of monotype because you talked mm -hmm. about proofs and counter proofs and ghosts, uh, you know, pulling that ink off the matrix, whatever the plexi or the metal or whatever it is, you're like pulling that off and then pulling it off, pulling off the residue or pulling a proof off the proof itself. There are so many different ways of achieving variations of the image and then yes. and then mixing it with other mediums and yes. and Degas of all like he was a master of that um, taking taking the proof and then using whatever uh, pastel or another medium to um, to heighten it and to change it. So I, it's just as a medium as you're showing us today it has infinite possibilities. It's really challenging and welcoming at the same time. So I, I love these images. Hmm? It's in me. Yeah, yeah. There's no thing too much with. Yeah. Which is, you know, part of the, I hope takeaway that those who are here with us will consider. I'm going to see if my second dry, uh, sheet is dry. Thank you. Yeah, they're dry. So I have the all orange. And then I have the multicolor purple green <laughs> blue. And I'm just going to go with multicolor. Okay, so I have the second one. How do I want to lay this one? Mm, kind of like that. Nah. Now, when you hear me making sounds, that's me talking to myself, going, no, that's not interesting. Don't do that. It has to interest my eye, not so much my intellect. I'm letting go of my intellect. You know, if I move it around, it'll find its place. No. It's almost like putting a puzzle together. <laughs> you want to just feel it. Look, yeah. It's like, are you, is it hot? Is it warm? Are you ice cold? about that. Hold on. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Okay, here we go. Almost glue. You know, my favorite, I have three favorite types of stores. Art stores, of course, I just love getting lost in there. 
bookstores when people sold books because the possibilities were endless, but really, really hardware stores. <laughs> I just love a hardware store. So I go in and I go, hmm, what kind of glues do they have here? What's this PC T glue? Um, what's that uh, Gorilla Glue? I find I really like to work with rubber cement because it's works rubber very. Cement. My gosh, it's like a blast from the past. <laughs> I know. Well, you know, I stopped using it after high school because, you know, it just was not something I put in my cart when I would check out at the art store. And uh, I rediscovered it in, uh, when I was about like 22. <laughs> not rediscovered, but, you know, started buying it again. And it's works on so many different mediums I find and you know it doesn't have to you don't have to just layer it on and stick it you can take it off and then you can stick it to multiple things which I always find is very helpful so when you're not sure if you want something to stick permanently I um I used to love making the little rubber cement balls too oh, yeah <laughs> So glad you said that, Julia, because that's all I can think of. <laughs> like little erasers. Oh yeah. yeah. No, they did. I we used to do that. Um, except we would use that. We would let them dry out under our in our little cubby in our art class, <laughs> and we would use them as like bouncy balls. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. So I'm going to get a fresh piece of paper. Um, paper. So when I want to see what I really have, I will place what I've done on a clean piece of white paper. Because now I don't have the residue from the towel. I don't have any other things to distract me. I'm going to remove all this stuff, including my working get the most pristine piece of white paper I can find. And now I can take a good look. Can you see this? Can you see them? Yeah. yeah. Yes, we can. Sorry. I thought I was unmuted. Yeah. <laughs> now I get a feeling from them. Mm -hmm. It's not about the process anymore. And I find this one intriguing. This one tells me more than that one. Sometimes I have Matt. Hold on. See if I have some.
I feel like like Julia's studio is a wonderland. I know. You know like I get lost in there for hours. Right. <laughs> I, I I just want to go explore all the materials. <laughs> oh. That really helps me, right? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, hmm, I can, now I'm looking at her eyes. Sometimes I'll do this, give me a second. Um, so I still find it interesting. Sometimes I'll just take a piece of glass there we go, because now I can see all of the texture, all of the texture that's happening here, and I find that interesting. So you see why I like non-reflective glass? Because you can see it, but this really allows me to look at it for what it is by itself. Okay, so there is a reflection on it. If I move it, oh, here we go. Can you still so, see that? Yeah. So when you're doing this, if you don't have a sheet of glass, just handy. I have these little like folder things and I, I did that. Yes. You can put them in there. That's and it also doing. shows all of that, yeah. You know, whenever I see something in my house that I could use later, I forget what kind of shelves these were. <laughs> and I say, ooh, I have a hole for you. Now, this was not bad. You know, I don't mind it. I've got some interesting white shapes. You know, I can engage with this little girl and she's got some interesting color and I can see my textures coming through. What this does, it really helps me to look at it. This is okay. But for me, this is the one. It's just saying more to me. It's communicating more to me. Do you have any questions about this? You know, why this one is the one I prefer? No. Oh. Do, do you understand what, what I can see? I, th I think, Julie, we all probably have thoughts about it because it's, um, you know, it's not a passport picture. <laughs> right yeah. obviously right but but i don't know do you want to ask uh, how people feel about it before you talk about it i mean if if people would like to put their thoughts in the chat that would be great yeah that'd be it's really interesting. for me it has this like air of mystery and it leaves you kind of like wanting to know more almost that's really very perceptive. Yeah, because now I'm making you think about it, which is why I like it. You know, I don't know why. Yeah, I don't know why. It, it has a, a Hitchcockian feeling to me mm -hmm. between the color people. and right and the, you know, the fact that she's just, you know, peering over at us. Mm -hmm. you know? It, again, the mystery. Ooh. So she's, she has no mouth. Mm -hmm. I'll be right back. Let me scratch some of that off. Mm -hmm. I'm very fussy with my stuff. <laughs> I'm very loose. I'm very loose and then I get fussy. What I'm fussy about is, oh, I can see, you know, there's a little bit of a I don't want the distraction of whatever's on this glass. So I'm going to look to remove it. Yes, someone said, uh, I think it's, uh, Anon I, I hope I'm saying this right. Ananya um, says, to me, it's more like a stitch in time. Her yes. eyes allow us in, but also tells a story about the background. That's beautiful. That's a wonderful sensitive perception. 
beautiful perception. So, you know, I could choose the safer of the two. The other one's safer. The other one is about a little girl and she's cute. But this is a little more difficult. This is more like a, a young a young girl on the verge of something. There's mm -hmm. more of an open-ended searching uh, quality to this that could go in any it could go in any direction. Now this image might lead me to something. I like it enough, but I don't know if it will. I like it enough to say, wow, I'm curious about her. Um, what she's doing with her eyes. She's obviously young. She looks kind of innocent, but she's sort of stuck or chooses to be silent. So this is more daring for me than the other. Let me see if I can slow this down. Do I need to bring the phone closer to it or are we good, Olivia? I think that um, we can't really see texture or details right now. Yeah, I think bringing the phone closer might give us uh, a little more insight on the okay, um, image. Yeah. Because now we can see all those little white specks in between from the dryer sheets, uh, between the weaving and the dryer sheets too. So the dryer sheet is doing its thing. It's saying, I took some color here, some color there, and the color, look at that kind of turquoise in the corner right there. That's mm -hmm. interesting. Okay. And it's saying, you yeah. know, this is, this is me. This is my texture. I'm doing, look, and there's that texture right next to her head. Mm -hmm. A little bit of this, that airiness. And then you have this drawing. And then the dryer sheet continues to give me interest in the way it's holding color. So this is what we've got. She's peering at us. <laughs> okay, so that helped, right? Seeing it closer. And I can hold it if you wanted to look at it more and make some comments. Of course, the phone is reflected on the glass. So there's a little bit of that. Yeah. But this is a good, this is a pretty good um, option here. Okay, so I'm going to put the phone back and then we can talk. Great. Does, we are approaching the last 10 minutes of this program. So if anybody has worked on any of, uh, on anything and would like to share, you can feel free. I'll take the spotlight off Julia and we can all take a little look or um, if you guys would prefer um, not to, that's fine. We can just talk about Julia's piece a little bit more as well. I think that would be amazing. I'm gonna sing. Um, ah, there we go. Ooh, that feels good. Um, and Julia, um, we we have one comment that they can't hear very well um, from your end. So if maybe you just speak a little closer to the computer, that might help a little bit. Okay. Thank you. Is this better? Maybe a little bit. Yeah. For I'm not having much of an issue on my end, but you know, sometimes people's uh, don't. Uh, aren't able to hear as well, just depending on their Wi-Fi and um, also just on their computer capabilities. So it's good to get nice and close. Well, I'm as close as I can get to the laptop. Okay. 
Let me oh. know if you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. Um, and let's see. Yeah. And if anyone has any issues, just send me a direct message and I'll, I'll uh, try and help out a bit. Okay. Um, all right. So where were we, Julia? We were talking about how this piece has created some interest for me. I agree. The dryer sheets where I was just playing, 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 all of a sudden are uh, giving me some direction. Yeah. One of the things I wanted for people to notice is that how loose I was when I was making this stuff. But when I'm looking at it, I'm very fussy. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be distracted by little blobs on the glass. I don't want to be distracted by brown paper with splattered ink. Now all of a sudden, I'm demanding and I'm fussy. But not when I'm playing. Okay. So, and I feel like that's a very opposite approach to uh, art that, you know, a lot of people do take. A lot of people are very particular as they go along. Um, I know that's how I used to approach art when I was uh, taking classes and trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. But um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I find now as an adult, I have much more fun doing art. I think I burned out and I think that's a good way to approach art for like, and also just kind of like seeing where things go. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts on that. Oh, yeah. You know, it's interesting for you to say it that way, Olivia, because I think you have to have a lot of self-confidence not to know how something is going to turn out to allow yourself that openness and that freedom. And again, we were talking about taking risks and in a way that, I mean, that's really the creative process. And, and I think why we, we relate so, so closely to what Degas was doing with that monotype. In a way it, it freed him um, to be his most creative self, arguably. Yeah. Well, I mean, even today, I was, uh, I didn't have all the supplies I needed. I didn't have glue. I didn't have any transparent paper. So I kind of just like wung it and was like, well, maybe if I put something over something. And so I tried a couple of different things out. Like, for example, with this one, I, my sketch, I took and I uh, did a marker drawing over it on the dryer sheet. Okay. Oh, you did. So this is an old sketch from a few years ago from the front of my house. And then... Uh -huh. I took one piece out of my sketchbook and this is, um, oh, it's upside down. I kind of like it upside down though. Um, <laughs> and it's the dryer sheet on top of a sheet of paper because I had done a charcoal drawing on this one. Oh, that's so interesting. Um, the, I've never done that. I'm gonna yeah. Have to try. <laughs> well, I was just trying to figure out a way to make it work. And I really ended up liking the second one I did a lot more with the face. You know what, I might have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm just wondering, does anybody have any, anybody, anybody else in the audience have anything to share? Any, um, any what they've been working on? And I'm going to allow, at this point, um, allow people to unmute themselves if they so uh, would like, so you guys can, don't have to use the chat function if you guys want to share some thoughts. Um, more than welcome to. Mm -hmm. Um, we're, we're looking at the chat. Meantime, Julia, would you consider that piece finished? Yes. Yeah. I don't have to fuss with it anymore. It's yes. intriguing me. Yeah. It gave me texture, air, color, and engagement. What else do I want? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's very exciting. Very exciting. Well, while we're waiting for, for any last thoughts, I did want to let people know that I put in the chat um, information about upcoming uh, workshops that are related to the exhibit landscape art and virtual travel. So um, with uh, the artist, James McElhenney, and they're coming up in June, July, and uh, with a critique in August. And then Julia will be back in August, in, uh, sorry, in July. That's gonna be on July 18th at the same time on a Sunday, Sunday, July 18th. And we're gonna get another incredibly rare and, and um, profound view into 
um, her artistic process. So I hope you all will join us again um, on July 18th. Um, if uh, anybody, uh, anything to share, any final thoughts from our, our audience here? No? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Julia. This has been so fun, so insightful, and uh, we're always happy to have you here. <laughs> Uh -huh. uh, yeah, really, totally. Thanks, Olivia. Thank you so much, Julie. It's, it's, it's just so, so much fun and so enlightening. And um, Blaine, Jane, aka Kenneth, <laughs> Nancy, and Anaya, um, who I think has, has left, um, who thought the work was beautiful. Thank you all so much for being with us today. And have a wonderful weekend. And we will see you again soon. Stay well. Julia, again, our thanks, and we hold you in the highest esteem. Take care. I'll hold you right you. back. All right. <laughs> <laughs> thanks all. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> back at. Okay. Live long and prosper. Oh, right. Oh, no. <laughs> Live long and prosper. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> all right. I can do that. Bye-bye. <laughs>